words of my young son, dude, that is a lot of water. I just did some arithmetic while I was sitting back here. The state says that most of the water delivered to urban water users, that's our residential users, is estimated at 3.4 million gallons, 3.4 million acre feet of water. You guys are gonna have to check out my math. So I did, the, I did this little bit of arithmetic. In this room, which is about 100 by 100, I estimated, the amount of water that's transferred to Southern California for residential uses is a footprint of this size of the building, 14,850 feet tall. That is, like, that is 2,811 miles of water above you and I. Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona's numbers for uh, water consumption. Highest tier, $9.48 per 100 cubic feet, 748 gallons of water. I did a little bit of arithmetic. That's about 25 cents to wash your clothes in a modern washing machine. It'd be double that in an old washing machine. 20 to wash, 20 to rinse, 20 gallons to 20 gallons. This is still darn cheap water. I was at a talk a while back, M MWD. They said they did a good job of masking the cost and the, and the effort it takes to bring water to us. And I think that is the problem. I applaud all of the high prices of water because if water is priced according to its real value, is it really precious? Then it needs to have some value applied to it. It would be something that you don't flush down the toilet. It would be something that you actually do cherish. And if there's water, if there's money in water, there's money for all of us to conserve it. Nobody's going to pay me $2,000 to save $250 worth of water. So let me get on with what I'm doing. <laughs> I talk a lot about water conservation. Since I was an, a, a, a student at Cal Poly, I was taught how to do this stuff by one of the masters, <laughs> Dr. Yotsai Hung. And from that day on, I was an advocate of water conservation and drip irrigation. So. I was asked to do this, to demystify drip irrigation. In my opinion, there is no mystic about it. There's no mystery. But let me get on with this. I go this way. So to demystify, there's the definition of it from Merriam-Webster. But to me, it is to expose and to expose the myths. That is that drip irrigation is new and unproven. Well, it's not. It's been around for quite some time. It's different, it's difficult, it ex it's expensive. In my opinion, it's just something that we're not aware of. It's something that we're uncomfortable with. So over there in Demystify, I want to give comfort and to expose. So to talk about the history, it goes way back when, in ancient times, they used clay pots and buried these clay pots in the root zone of plant material, typically crops. And the, cr the clay pot, the clay pot would allow water to slowly seep into the root environment. And today, you can still buy these things. <laughs> and for some reason, they make them look like gourds. But these you can buy today. In Afghanistan, they did some work with subsurface drip, subsurface drip irrigation. It wasn't really drip, but it was low flow, where they buried clay pipes in the ground. And actually, there was a dual purpose. They could energize the pipes or put some small bit of pressure in the pipes to irrigate, but then they could put a reduced pressure or vacuum and drain the fields. And in Colorado, we had some work done with applying water directly to the root zone. Perforated pipe was used in, Germany's in, in Germany in the 20s. So we're talking about some history here, aren't we? It's something that has been done. Nobi experimented with um, weeping pipe, or he used, uh, I think, porous canvas hose. After World War II, when the advent of plastics became more widespread, so too <coughs> did the manufacture and distribution of drip irrigation products. And in 59, a company in Israel had the first patent for a plastic drip emitter. And that's this 
That is actually this drawing right here. I got this from the U.S. Patent Office. And this uh, innovation led to what? Stamping out, stamping out these really inexpensive drip irrigation products. It made it, it made it profitable to do this kind of work. So how much water do you wear? <laughs> I think all these numbers are really cool. A t-shirt requires 713 gallons of water to produce. Most of that is in, of course, the growing of the cotton. In fact, 45% of it is in irrigating the crop, 41% of it is in natural precipitation. Yes, these people put natural precipitation into the equation. The rest of the water used to produce this 250 grams of cotton is to dilute wastewater in the in industrial process. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, they have a product, a product gallery at waterfootprint.org. It's down there at the bottom of that slide. And you can do your water footprint just like you can do your carbon footprint. It's pretty interesting. I went through it, although I don't know how many kilograms of grain I consume every week. <laughs> That's the question they ask. So my proposition in all of this is to convince you that drip irrigation is not new. It's not unusual. So the proposition in, in this case for this purpose is to tell you that all irrigation is drip irrigation. And what is the difference? Well, we have natural precipitation, and then we have our own manipulation of the environment by adding water, supplemental irrigation. And we have these basic products, spray head rotors and then drip irrigation. What's the difference between these two? Well, it all has to do with size of the water droplet. What's the distance between the water droplets and at ra what rate do they fall? And this is the information we use to design drip irrigation systems. And I caught I some pretty, pretty good information. Rain is very unusual. A raindrop, although you've been in the desert in some summer monsoonal rains, where the droplets feel like they're the size of quarters. <laughs> but it, t it turns out that no, wa no rain droplet gets much bigger than five millimeters. Because while it's following, the wind shear breaks it apart at that size. A raindrop does not, does not look like that pendant drop up on the top. It's actually spherical until it gets big enough that the wind resistance compresses it. Then it be becomes to look like a, a uh, hamburger bun. It gets bigger because it falls faster and it coalesces with the smaller drops that have more, the res wind resistance slows down. So they get bigger and then they break apart and become smaller. The distribution uniformity of, of rain, of course, is very good in areas relative to landscape. But we know that rain is not uniform. In fact, that's one of the problems we have in the state is the, the ununiform distribution of water. Well, this is going slower than I thought. Spray heads, and this work was done by some really smart people at a place called CIT. They were measuring rain dr uh, water drop sizes from different emission, de emission uh, devices, sprinklers primarily. Water drops 0.02 to 06 inches from a spray head, and the rates of application between one and two inches an hour. Oh, let me go back here. Rates of application from natural precipitation, why is this? Light stratiform 0.04, we're familiar with that, it's kind of a misting. That's the rate of the fall of water. We measure this in inches and in time of hours. Moderate, moderate stratiform events, 0.25 inches an hour, and th heavy thunderstorms are one inch an hour. And we all know, especially you from the East Coast or the Southeast, rain can fall considerably higher. But this is the information I got from a website. Compared to Application, application rates of spray heads at one to two inches an hour. Now this is fairly recent, and this has to do with the company that's sponsoring this event. 16 months ago, maybe 18 months ago, this number would not be one inch an hour, one to two inches an hour. It would be 1.75 to two inches an hour. We have a new product now that is a spray head product that applies water at a very low rate of application. Why is this important? Less runoff, more infiltration into the soil. So I'm giving this company now a plug. They came up with an innovative device. They did something with a spray head that has not been done since there were spray heads. The ir irrigation efficiencies, however, from spray equipment can be and probably are quite low, 50 to 
the state rec recognizes 62.5% for spray equipment. And that goes into the calculations for estimating water requirement. I think experience shows that spray head efficiency can be even lower than that. So, but for this presentation, I'm saying 50 to 63%. The problem with the spray equipment, as is the problem with all overhead irrigation, is that we're throwing water up into the air for what purpose? Hoping that it lands where we want it to be. <laughs> Does that really happen? You saw the pictures Dave showed. Even in a low wind condition, water doesn't actually go where you want it to. So water distributed from these systems are, is very strongly impacted by environmental conditions, primarily those that cause wind. Rotors, droplet size is a little bit bigger, rates of application can vary, and that all depends on discharge from the, from the device itself, that's the nozzle pressure issue, and uh, how far apart these rotors are. Distribution can be quite good. In fact, I'll show you another example later on where we did a number that Dave referred to as the scheduling coefficient. We use, we use a program called Hyperspace, and we model the distribution uniform for uniformity from rotor-type sprinklers for broad turf areas. And we're able to get to numbers that are like scheduling coefficients of 1.1, 1.2. In fact, we rarely will accept a distribution uniformity or scheduling coefficient greater than 1.2. And that primarily says that at 1.2, you have to apply, you have to run your irrigation system 20% longer to apply the mean amount of water to the driest spot on the landscape. But these systems can be efficient, and they're, they are very effective for larger areas, primarily larger turf areas, where there's no obstruction from shrubbery. Drip irrigation. Now, while the scores of low, low flow irrigation equipment, drip irrigation has rates of discharge a half to one gallon per hour. That's at each emission point. They are very conservative, although those, syst those products that have application or flow rates higher than two are more likely to be considered trickle irrigation. I have a slide to show that. Rates of application can be low, can be high. It depends on, on the emission point discharge, how much water comes out of the emitter, and how close or how far apart you put those points. Droplet size, and I just put in there because I have the other droplet sizes. Droplet sizes from drip irrigation can be quite large. In fact, they would be as large as they can get, where the water drips to the point where the, s the weight of the water drop breaks off from the source. That's what's actually called the pendant drop. However, it's of, it's of little importance because we're placing water down on the ground. It's very less affected by those, co those conditions that cause evaporation. So how much water do you ride on? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is, well, I guess I'm more excited about it than you are. <laughs> 2.6 <Yeah. laughs> gallons of water to produce one sheet of paper. That's, that's assuming that the paper is made from wood pulp. So here are those pendant drops we were talking about. We're, so with drip, we're going to describe a method of water application that where we express water from a small orifice at low velocity, and it's allowed to form a drip or a drop. In this case, where the flows are 0.5 to 1 to 2, up to 2 gallons a minute, or 2 gallons per hour, excuse me, is drip irrigation. It's point source irrigation. And this very well means that the application of water from this drip does not form a puddle. So it's point source. We're applying water so that it actually goes right into the soil. And this is the emitter outside of the soil environment. This is on surface application. As opposed to flows, emission point flows that are greater than two gallons an hour, where we have trickle irrigation. This could be considered area, area application or area source, where that very localized application of water is too high for the infiltration rate of the soil, and there is some ponding that it happens. You can get better distribution of water laterally within the soil this way, but it's not much better. These systems can actually cause runoff. We have better control of water if we apply it with drip irrigation because we're not throwing it up in the air. Now, we're putting it on 
the root zone, above or within the root zone, or within an area that can be future root zone. This picture over here shows what happens with emission point spacing. On this, the soil is uniform here in this, in this example. At 12, point or 12 inch spacing, you can see the, the distance between the wet spots. There's our, there are emitters underneath the ground in that row. This is an ag crop. And at eight inches, you see that at, with the same water time, the wetted perimeters are already coalescing. In a clay soil, as you can see right here, the capillary forces are greater than the gravitational forces of water within the soil. When we put water in the soil with a drip irrigation system, we depend on the soil to distribute the water, not on just broadcasting water over the surface as a way to distribute water. We're using the capillary properties of the soil to move the water laterally away from our point of application. In a sand, gravitational forces are approximately equal to capillary forces. So the width of the wetted pattern is approximately equal to the depth of the wetted pattern. Now, if I ran the system too long, that water would continue to fall as gravitational water. And you would have this long, wet pattern, which would be what? Wasted water. It would flow out of the root zone. In sand, capillary forces are lesser than gravitational forces, so you get this really long, wetted pattern, in which case you'd have to bring the emission point spaces closer together. together. System efficiencies are recognized by the state as 90%. So what are the components of drip irrigation system? Well, I have, I have actually done this, although I didn't have a garden maiden. <laughs> so we have a water source. It's the community water source. And we put the water into the pipe. In this case, it's into the pail. And we have a potentially potential energy storage device that gives us our pressure. And we have a connection to the water source, which is up there, that pail to small hose connection detail. And we have the small hose that runs out of the pail or out of the water source to our target, which is the crop. In this case, it's a small hose with smaller holes. And fortunately, we have another garden maiden. She's number two. and she places the emitter points next to the plants, and then she takes care of the plants. In reality, that's not what we're doing today. We're doing something more like this. This is a diagram of a subsurface drip irrigation zone. And these are the com components that are required for subsurface irrigation. The water source is here. It comes into this inlet manifold. This over here is a, is a detail of a start connection. Then we run through these hoses that are placed according to emission point spacing and the type of soil that we have. In the clay soil you saw, we could spread these out because the water spreads laterally. In the sand soil, we'd have to move these spaces closer together. This is an air vacuum device, air vacuum relief device that's on a manifold so that all the laterals could see this access to the atmosphere. The, the issue here is when we turn the irrigation system off, there is a vacuum created in the hose. We don't want the emitter emitters to suck dirt back into the hose, so we allow that vacuum to be broken. We allow the, the hoses then to open the atmosphere and, w and air to then displace the water through this device. That's not going to prevent all the dirt from entering the emitters. So we have a flush device. And every time this irrigation system comes on, a small amount of water is flushed out of this place. So any silt or debris that gets into the drip lines will migrate towards this location and be flushed out. This is what those products look, those components look like in plan view on a project. Uh, this project happens to be in Las Vegas. But this is actually, I get the right mouse? This is the planted area, and these are the drip lines. This is an obstruction. This is a wall around some utilities. Now, how would I put sprinklers in there? It would be very difficult because these spaces are very small. I could not put sprinklers in there with the variety of sprinklers that are available from even Toro manufacturing and prevent water from spraying onto this wall or onto that walk. 
And this shows that I can place water directly into this area with no runoff, no overspray. Well, runoff would depend on management. I can actually put too much water and would drip also. It's not a panacea. So here you have the control valve. I'm coming from this dark line, which is the main line, into an inlet manifold where these start connections are. You saw those in the back in the last picture. These are the drip lines that are running in a pattern according to the soil conditions, emission point discharge, and the spacing between the emitters. And there, down here at the end on this exhaust manifold is the, uh, the end flush with a sump underneath it so that water will drain into the soil. If it's convenient, I'd like to put the end flush near a source of water requirement. I would put my, my end flush near a tree or near a shrub that likes to have a lot of water. You're kidding. Bring the green card back up. <laughs> so how much water do you eat, or how much water is in that burger? These are astounding numbers. It takes 15,500 liters of water to produce one, ki one kilogram of boneless beef. That's because it takes three years to bring the cow to the house and make the beef. All of this water, almost all of it, 15,300 liters of water is used to grow the crops that we feed to the cow. That's, this is to produce the 2.2 2 .2 pounds or one kilogram of beef. But this is it, 126 water cooler bottles is in that hamburger. Water cooler bottles, it's a five gallon bottle you tip up and put on the cooler. Okay. What are the advantages? Application of water to my target. Less weed growth. This is an example of a, a sparse planting with drip irrigation. This was actually done on a study just recently to show that we could reduce cost and reduce water consumption. How much of that one minute do I have left? <laughs> They're ex drip irrigations are extremely flexible. Like I showed you before, I can put water just where I want it. Now, these are parking lot islands that we're all familiar with. And I'm putting water directly in the soil, not on the pavement, <laughs> not on the cars. And I'm going to avoid these issues that we've all seen so many times until we're just so used to it, it becomes acceptable. This is a project that we've actually worked up on up in um, up. this one here. It's not as dramatic as the pictures you show that you saw from Mr. Pagano. But this system ran for only a couple of minutes. It was during a walkthrough to get the hydrozones of the existing condition. You can see in the background all that water spraying off onto the pavement. pavement. This can be completely avoided with drip irrigation. Their ex drip irrigation systems are ex exceptionally flexible because of the myriad of fittings that we have. Drip hose is flexible. I can make, make it go anywhere I want it to go. Now here are some of the numbers that we talked about that everyone has talked about previously. This is a project recently left our office. It happened to be a school project with 55,000 square foot of active play area. And the rest of the four acres was, it, there was a, another small turf area, but the rest of it was shrub planters. This is the estimated requirement used with typical irrigation efficiencies of overhead irrigation systems. It comes out to be 9.6 acre feet. And in this case, it was actually 93% of Mawa. Mawa is the maximum allowed water that the state will let me use. If I convert all those shrub areas to drip and use the efficiencies of a drip irrigation system, you can see I reduced my water consumption by 20%. And this is still keeping that 55,000 square feet of turf. Here's a cost comparison, like that picture you saw before. We were, asked to to, we were asked to tell what the cost implications would be to convert a parkway from spray heads that you see here to drip irrigation. Now these numbers, all we did was supply the differences in the equipment. That's the deduct of the spray heads uh, th and the controls. That would be the valves, the wires, and stations. That's controller uh, station count. 
we added this equipment, which is drip lines, air vacuum relief valves, end flushes, and adding regulation and filtration to the valve. Now, these are not my numbers, and I don't agree with them, but they came from a substantial landscape contractor. In the case of spray, we're look t talking about $4.22 a foot. It will be expensive because these areas are smaller. I would not agree with this amount of expense, but this is how the numbers came. The drip system was 215. This also accounts for the fact that we are only irrigating 70% of the area because we can. We can put the water on drifts of plants. The difference being $2 per square foot. So it can be cost effective. The disadvantages, small orifice irrigation. So, of course, there's resistance to drip, and there always is. I'm a consultant, and almost every time, every project that I have, I say, why aren't we using drip? We should be using drip here. We should be using drip there. And continuously, it's resisted. Why? What is so, what is so special about Southern California? You go, in fact, if you just go out to the desert, what do you see? Drip. You go across the border, what do you see? Come on. Drip. <laughs> but we do have these issues that we have to contend with. We have to filter. That first sh slide I showed of the first patented drip irrigation device was a torturous path device, or long flow. They used a very small orifice around a tube to dissipate the energy. It's a non-pressure compensating emitter. Now, the advent of the pressure compensating device also gives us another advantage. They are also self-flushing because the size of the orifice changes with the differences in pressure. So to combat the, the disadvantages, we can filter, we can use products that allow themselves to flush, and we can regulate the pressure. Now, putting soil, putting moisture in the root environment, it's inevitable that roots are going to grow into the water source. The, pro <laughs> the company that sponsored this event has a product <laughs> that will not allow this to happen. And that's this product right here. It's called Root Guard. These, this drip tubing here that you can see the roots have grown into, I dug these up in my own yard. I know that this happens. And if the roots grow into your irrigation system, you're talking about replacement. So you have to prevent that from happening by one method or another. <coughs> now, it's frail equipment. Drip irrigation is plastic. <laughs> Hoses are small. And why do they do this? Because it's inexpensive. I came home from work one day to find my son with his buddy in the backyard shooting arrows into the ground. I have subsurface drip irrigation everywhere in my backyard. I said, Brian, what are you doing? <laughs> you know there's tubes underneath the ground. So no lawn darts, please. We cannot do this. Besides, it's dangerous. <laughs> uh, disadvantages, and we've all seen this. If I have subsurface or even surface drip irrigation, every two years, what's going to happen? <laughs> Somebody wants their name to be seen, and they stick it in the ground. What do you do with the shovel when you're working in the garden? You've done your job. You're done with the shovel. I know what I do. I poke it in the ground. Well, you have to be careful. So no poking of shovels. Frail equipment, of course, rodents. Um, you know, you can see this is a, a tube that was chewed by an animal. I'm actually a farmer. I come from subtropical fruit production. The coyotes were eating through the drip tubes. Most people want to go out and shoot the yotes. Well, as fun as that might be, it's not really the thing to do. So somebody else came up with the idea of, well, well, why don't we just put water out for them? And that's what they did. They put buckets of water out so the coyotes would have a source of water. Solved the problem. Now, we're talking about water conservation. This is irrigation related. I'm, I'm an irrigation consultant. I design irrigation systems. And I only have products and I only have methods and techniques that will allow me to be so much conservative. I can only bring my efficiencies up to a certain point. 
there's an equation here for water, com water consumption. That's water in, water out. The plant uses the water. What we do is we, we replace the water. So my point to you is this. I can only do so much. You have to do the rest. You have to reduce your water demand. We don't need to have all this grass. We don't need to have all this lush landscape. We can have these beautiful landscapes with plant material that have water consumptive numbers that are considerably, considerably lower. Dave talked about uh, species factors, turf being 80%, warm season turf being a little bit lower, 60%, maybe it's substantially lower. But I can get you down to 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 for all your shrubs, and you will still have a lush looking landscape. So there has to be a collaboration. It's not just the irrigation guy, it's the guy that does the plants, the guy or girl, whoever. So actually I collaborate with landscape architects on designing landscapes with regionally appropriate l plant material and efficient irrigation systems. And that's what it's going to take to reduce the water consumptive consumption in our outdoor use. So here's some samples. I'm just going to go through these because I'm already out of time. This is surface, surface installation of drip irrigation, exposed to, susceptible to the elements, Although this, this installation is quite neat and it would probably be covered with mulch, it is still susceptible, easily damaged by anybody walking through that area. Neat application, although I have a question, this looks like it would be an area of different plant material and, and you can see these lines run straight through. It's going to be the same zone. And I often see this, if you uncoil the hose and not unroll the hose, it's still going to have the twisting and that twisting will accentuate it will raise up out of the mulch, and you will see it. So this is a guy that did a great job on a subsurface installation in his own backyard. Right here we have preparation. He built these borders with two by sixes. You can see this is a, an inlet or exhaust manifold, and there's another one down there at this end. Air vacuum relief valve, end flush, controls. See the drip lines there? Right here, test it, backfill it, grow it, grow, mow, and enjoy. <laughs> Here's another one with a curvilinear landscape. Now this is very ad advantageous. If you can get your if you can get your site at minus four inches, you can lay this stuff down, get the spacing just right, staple it, and then bring in the backfill. So, and I, I just picked these pictures up off the site, although I've done this in my own backyard. So he's testing it, and then here's the installation over here. It looks beautiful, of course. They took a picture of it. In my quest to bring some humor to this very dry subject, I looked at, I looked for irrigation humor, sprinkler humor, sprinkler jokes. I could find nothing that was appropriate. So, and this is, <laughs> this, is, this is actually the best I could find. <laughs> so, so, there you go. I'm Steve Baker. I'm an irrigation consultant. 